First Wednesdays is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council and by the Kellogg Hubbard Library with video production supported by Orca Media. in 1852 at this very podium. 
in the previous state house. And she was talking about something outrageous at that time, women's suffrage. Yeah, a big idea. And then, a hundred years ago, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution took care of that. And we have devoted ourselves to documenting the story of women in this building from Clarina Howard Nichols' time to the current time. And you'll see it in the east staircase as you exit the State House. Be sure to take a good look at that story. It is a story of empowerment. And it began with her back in the 19th century, but it has had many characters. So tonight, we summon the ghosts of the State House. <laughs> Women such as Edna Beard, the very first to take her seat in this chamber as soon as women had the right to vote. They sent Edna Beard here. And today, 40% of our legislature are women. That's not gender parity quite yet, but we would submit that they have conquered the building in important ways. For example, all four committee chairs that control the appropriations and the taxation are controlled by women. <laughs> Ultimate power is vested in their hands at this point, I think it's safe to say. And that's the story we celebrate downstairs. It's also the story that we celebrate tonight. With the help of our partners, the Friends of the Vermont State House, let's give them a round of applause. But the big partner, the big partner, and we've had a lot of partnerships with the Vermont Humanities Council they put this program together tonight, and here to talk about it briefly is Tess Taylor, Director of Programs. Tess. Well, hello, everybody. It's so fun to stand up here. I want to thank the organizers of Farmers State for hosting the Vermont Humanities with our partners, the Friends of Vermont State House, and the Kellogg Hubbard Library here in Montpelier for this evening's event. This honoring the 19th Amendment, Amendment through word and song uh, has been a real labor of love for quite a while. Um, it's always a pleasure and honor to be here in the People's House, surrounded by lawmakers, citizens, neighbors, and friends. So first, let me tell you about the people who helped make this possible. Our statewide underwriter is the Institute of Museum and Library Services to the Vermont Department of Libraries. Our Montpelier series underwriter is the Peter Gilbert Endowment Fund. Our library partner is the Kellogg Hubbard Library. And the underwriter of this talk is the Cabot Cooperative. Um, and there will be cheese afterwards. <laughs> Tonight's program is a collaboration a first and a world premiere. The collaboration being between Meg Mott, Constitution Scholar, and Neely Bruce, composer and also Constitution Scholar, and singers comprised of your neighbors, your legislators, and friends of Neely from all sorts of places, Massachusetts, Connecticut, all here to lend their voices to this beautiful music. The first that's happening here is this is the first time that Neely's compositions, setting the Bill of, Bill of Rights to music, will have been performed in the state capitol. And then the world premiere refers to the fact that you will be the first audience to hear Neely's brand new composition, the 19th Amendment, sung here, sung anywhere. So um, I'd like to present our, um, our presenter's bios, and then I'll turn the program over to Meg Mott. So Neely Bruce is a professor of music and American studies at Wesleyan University. He is a composer, conductor, pianist, and scholar of American music. 
His largest work is entitled Convergence, commissioned by the American Composers Forum as part of its Continental Harmony Project. It premiered June 18, 2000, as part of the New Haven International Festival of Arts and Ideas. Bruce's opera, Hansel and Gretel, commissioned by Connecticut Opera, received its first performances as a chamber work for children in 1997. Meg Mott has been writing about the Constitution since she was a columnist for the Brattleboro Reformer in the 1990s. She earned her first PhD in political science at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where she wrote her dissertation on the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> For the last 20 years, she has taught political theory and constitutional law at Marlborough College. Her opinions on due process and college sexual misconduct cases have been published in the Washington Post, Inside Higher Ed, and cited approvingly on Breitbart. <laughs> she is currently working on a book, Good Clash, The Art of Productive Disagreement. I'm going to find my seat with the singers, and Meg's going to take over. Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Is my mic working OK? Yes. I'm having this amazing effect because I'm underneath the chandelier. First of all, I'm a little nervous. But second, there's a, this acoustic moment. So I feel very live right now. Is it too live for the rest of you? No, okay. Um, this body, this chamber, requires us to speak carefully, to be able to hear one another well, and th that has something to do with the acoustics. I noticed today when I was sitting in the assembly that people who spoke rapidly lost some of their words. And that makes sense in a deliberative body. So there's something about the architecture here which requires all of us to slow down um, and to be able to speak in such a way that everyone can hear us. I am very excited to be here tonight uh, because Tess, I think we spoke on the phone a year ago, and she had heard about the Debating Our Rights series that I've been doing at Brattleboro, and I said to her on the phone, there's this guy in Connecticut. I haven't actually met him, but he is, I think, on the exact same wavelength that I am on, which is that the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, all of it belongs to us, and though I love, 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 love lawyers, <laughs> lawyers do not own the Constitution. And even though I respect enormously all the Supreme Court justices, even the ones whose opinions I may not agree with, I respect their judgment, I respect their intellect, but even they do not own the Constitution. And something that's been happening in this country that is very, very sad, so sad, truly I'd be weeping right now, it's that a key element of our American constitutional system, which was the jury, which taught average citizens legal reasoning, which taught all people how important the law was, is, hardly exists anymore. So I think, and just to give you a statistic, um, maybe some of you know the Seventh Amendment, there will be some quizzes later as I ask you exactly what amendment is at stake. But if you knew the Seventh Amendment, you might know it has something to do with civil juries and how important they are. And I'm just curious, does anybody know what percentage of civil juries in the federal system actually perform their duty? Ah, oh, who said zero? Okay, it's, it's under 1%. So, and then if I were to talk about criminal juries or grand juries, the numbers are pretty, pretty sad. Uh, we have one person here from the ACLU, probably others. 
Uh, the key element, the word jury, shows up four times in the Constitution, and they hardly exist in this country. However, nature abhors a vacuum. I'm seeing this production tonight as something like the jury, but better, because we have a chorus. We have a composer. We're going to hear lots of voices. Um, so it's been a very exciting thing for me to be able to be part of a citizen jury spreading the word about the Constitution. I take this almost like a gospel. We're spreading the word of the Constitution and for everybody to have these words at their hand or in their diaphragm, which is what we're going to get tonight. Um, before we actually get going with the world premiere of the 19th, uh, I want to just take this opportunity because it's always fascinating to talk to the composer. So Neely, can, can I ask you just a couple of questions? Sure. Um, are you on the mic? I am on the mic. <coughs> can people hear Neely? Can people hear me now? Yes. Hi, yes. Meg. Hey, Neely. It's great to be here. Yeah, this is such a fun thing. It is. Um, so I'm curious, what made you want to do this? And, and if you wanted all these people to sing, what's, what's the... Well, I had set the Bill of Rights to music. And then I was asked to set the 19th Amendment to music. I was on a roll. People have asked me to, to set other amendments to music. I've also set the 13th Amendment. And I will be, that's one of the three Reconstruction Amendments that pertains to the slavery, the abolition of slavery, and universal manhood suffrage. And I was in the process of setting the 14th and 15th. So I think that's going to be it, but who knows? No. I might, I have, a, there's a, some wit and by a plaintiff who wants me to set the Prohibition Amendment, and back to back to the abolition of Prohibition. <laughs> and what about the preamble? Can I make a request? No, that's already been done. So you wouldn't do that? No. Okay, okay. It's famous, the, the, the settings of the preamble. I'm not in competition with that. Okay, um, and, and one other question I have is, what goes into your mind? Can hear you. Can hear you. Mic is gone? Mic is gone. Sound, please. Take Neely's mic. Oh, but that means I'm going to need to do it for the duration, perhaps? No, not necessarily. No, I think we're just cutting each other. Oh, the technology. All right, I get it. We can share. Yes. Um, so I'm just curious, what is some of your thinking as you're composing it? Because you don't just run through once. All sorts of other things are happening, and I'm curious, what is the musical thinking behind your compositions? This is a dangerous question to ask a composer, <laughs> but I will be very brief. Um, the, the, the Bill of Rights. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> said, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here in, in Vermont. Uh, listen, uh, you, the Bill of Rights, as you will hear, some of you are familiar with early American music, and specifically the music of William Billings. So uh, this, the Bill of Rights is based on the st musical style of William Billings and early American composers in general. But that seemed to be inappropriate for the, uh, for the 19th Amendment because it was not, uh, that's not an 18th century text. It's a 19th century text that eventually gets adopted in 1920, as we know. So I thought, well, what would be an appropriate style? Well, some of you know about this, but there's a whole repertory of early 19th century to mid-19th century pieces called glees. What is a glee? G-L-E-E. -E. It's what a glee club sings. Uh, and of course, glee clubs now sing all kinds of things, but historically, that's what they sang. A glee club is, some, is a group that sings glees, and this is a parlor music, recreational music for men and women to sing together in the 19th century, and there are lots of books of this kind of music. It's a somewhat different style. It's more something like the style of parlor music uh, uh, later on in the 19th century. It's a little bit uh, more relaxed. It's not so contrapuntal as the uh, style of William Billings. But anyway, that is my model for this. Uh, and you'll hear, I, t composers just repeat text because two reasons. One is if you repeat the text, you'll actually understand it eventually, and, which is true. And the other thing is you've got to make a longer piece of music anyway. It takes seconds to read the 19th Amendment, but it takes us about four minutes to sing it. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so
work now? Yeah. Is it working because, ah, I killed this machine. I actually turned it completely off, and now I don't need to use this. The other one comes back. Um, thank you so much for that beautiful rendition of the 19th Amendment. And did everybody hear how the first section was in the major key? The second section is in the minor key. That means things are getting real with the second section. Congress can do what is necessary to make sure that no state abridges the right to vote on account of sex. Now, we could think, glorious, isn't this fantastic? A hundred years ago this happened. Go team. Well, I got a little dark side here. It was ratified in 1920. We might think, whoa, that's amazing. We did it. There's another voice that we should be hearing, which is, why did it take so long? Abigail Adams writes a letter to John Adams. When we're making this new form of government, don't forget about the ladies. That's way in the back. Don't forget about the ladies, she says. But no, didn't happen. Um, but that didn't mean that women stopped. A lot of people point to this event, Seneca Falls, uh, over there in New York State, July 1848. You can't quite see who that woman is, but her name is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and she had a lot of cojones, we might say, in the trade. And she made certain claims. Now, there were a lot of other people behind her. Uh, but she had some very impressive claims that she wanted to make to try and start a new revolution. I think Elizabeth Cady Stanton is in the house. Does she have a mic? I do. <laughs> Excellent. Elizabeth, could you tell us, give us your first one. He has taken from her all right in property, even to the wages she earned. And this is something that we inherited from the British uh, or the Europeans, this idea of coverture, uh, that when you married, all of your property went to the husband. So if, you're, if you were unwed, it was usually your, your father who was in charge. And when you were married, everything you owned, all your property became the property of your husband. What else did you have to say? <laughs> He has compelled her to commit to laws in the formation by which she had no voice. How could that be? The very principle of a Republican form of government, and that's what it says in the Constitution, we have a Republican form of government. Do you know what it is? First thing you have to have. Representation, yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. There's this key principle of the Republican form of government. Consent of the governed. Consent of the governed. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't know who this woman is, but she's a very smart woman. Very smart. So, a little bit Katie Stanton is saying, how can you pass laws when you did not get the consent of the governed? What else did you have to say? He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. Oh! <laughs> when she said that in Seneca Falls in 1848, that was a big deal. It was one thing to call for consent of the government. It was another thing to say the marriage laws are atrocious. They're medieval. <laughs> but this is a really big statement. Um, I think she has some other people supporting her. Let's see. Oh yeah, ah, Frederick Douglass. Do you, you like this? Is Frederick Douglass in the house? Frederick <laughs> 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 uh, Douglass, what did you have to say about this? In this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of woman and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, but the meaning and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the government, of the world. Yes, 
Thank you for saying that, Frederick Douglass. Because the lovely thing about you and about the time, the mid-19th century, is everybody understood each other as having tremendous capacities, intellectual capacities, moral capacities. It's like every single one of you has a light inside. And if we can't exercise certain powers, that light is dimmed. And so by talking about the franchise, it is opening up for women this capacity to be intellectual, to be moral, and the entire country is going to get bigger and brighter. This is an old term. We don't talk about civic humanism anymore. But that's exactly what this idea is. So thank you, Frederick Douglass, for reminding us of our history of civic humanism. Oh, but not everybody agreed. And because her name is Lucretia Mott, <laughs> I think I know who wants to speak her. <clears throat> oh. Lizzie, they make us look ridiculous. That's a big statement. This is Lucretia Mott, a uh, foremother of my partner, which is why we kept this name. She hears that word about women voting, and that's her response. Now, you might think, oh my goodness, she had false consciousness. She had internalized the patriarchy. <laughs> there must be something wrong with her. But let's hold off for a minute and see like, exactly why would she, uh, Lucretia Mott, say this? Well, maybe it's because she had internalized this notion that if women were to get the vote, uh, all sorts of ridiculous things would happen. And this is what one magazine suggested. The ladies trying a scoundrel for breach of promise. Because we all know what would happen if ladies, 19th century ladies, were able to vote, were able to sit on juries, were able to be judges. They would bring in the scoundrel, the rascal, who promised marriage and then ran off with the girl next door. So this, is, this was very much in the minds of people as they're thinking about this. You let women take over, and it's going to be a soap opera. We can all count on it. But was that what Lucretia Mott had in mind? This is why she says we have to consider voting carefully. People are going to the polls and voting for warriors and slaveholders instead of seeking to enlighten the public mind. You vote, you're part of the system. Voting supports violence. Don't tell me that this suffrage is going to do anything. Men have the vote, look what they've done. Far be it from me to encourage women to vote or take an active part in politics in the present state of government. And if we think 1848, there's a lot of bad stuff happening. This is pre-Civil War. Um, Elizabeth, uh, sorry, uh, Lucretia Mott and other abolitionists wanted things to change. They wanted to end the slave power. Many of them did not uh, eat sugar, because sugar came from the cane fields. They did not wear cotton, because cotton came from the cotton fields. And so this idea that lifestyle politics is new, <laughs> they were doing this in the pre-Civil War era as well. This idea that the whole system is corrupt was not just Lucretia Mott. I don't know, you can't really see who that is, but maybe you've heard of William Lloyd Garrison. And William Lloyd Garrison looked at the Constitution. I'm a big Constitution fan. I love the fact that we have rule of law. I love the Constitution in all its imperfections. But William Lloyd Garrison said, the Constitution is an agreement with hell, a covenant with death. Don't tell me about the Constitution. Don't tell me about voting. Don't tell me about trying to change things through the system. It will not work. It is too corrupt. So this was one of the reasons why a lot of people thought that the suffrage was, was about as useful as, I don't know, 
getting your fingernails clipped. I don't know that it would be something superficial. It wasn't going to actually address the issue. And for good reason, these people said so about how bad the system was. In 1848, when the Seneca Falls is happening and Lucretia Mott says, I don't really care about this voting. People are just going to go to the polls and they're going to vote in warriors or slaveholders. Well, in the Constitution, there is this clause. It was known as the Fugitive Slave Clause, which is that if any slave got out of the slave states, into free states that wherever they landed, they need to be returned to their masters. It was a property understanding. And in 1850, because the slave states thought that was not rigorous enough, because people were not actually enforcing it, uh, they passed the Fugitive Slave Law. At that point, it's a powder keg, and from there, not surprisingly, we go to civil war. But I'm wanting to hold this out here. Uh, before we get all excited about the suffrage, there's a lot at stake. It's not just a simple matter. Um, so this is to give you a sense of why there was an argument about suffrage and about women's suffrage that was beyond, perhaps, the, um, the issue of voting itself. It was much bigger. OK, so I said there might be a quiz. And I'm just curious um, if anybody knows which in the Bill of Rights actually gives anybody a vote, a right to vote. Is there anything in the Bill of Rights that gives anybody a right to vote? You know, know what amendment that is? And the answer, somebody's saying no. Like, if there is none. No. Wait, you guys seem very clear about that. Is that right? This group seems to know for sure there's nothing in the Bill of Rights. Yeah, and, and somebody who's away, do you also not know if, if there's, is there anything in the Bill of Rights about voting? The 15th? Ah, oh, yes, there is something but in the 15th Amendment. Right, so we have something about voting in the 15th Amendment, but nothing in the Bill of Rights. Um, and, and I just want to want to take a pause. Are we okay over there? Do we need to have a, a stop in the program for any sort of medical emergency? Or are we okay to keep going? Okay. I want to make sure that we're not. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, so if everybody's all right, we're going to keep going, knowing that people are doing what they need to do over there to take care of somebody who has something. Um, so I think now may be a good time because I'm going to have lots more questions about things that maybe women could do that had nothing to do with voting. Uh, but before I help you with this question, is there anything that women had before they could vote that might show up in the Bill of Rights? Anything they might have had as a citizen, even if they weren't voters. Speech. Excellent. Excellent. OK. Um, I think there's a group of people who can educate us a lot about the Bill of Rights. So I'm going to turn it now back to the choral portion. <coughs>
going to sing the first five amendments at this point. Uh, there will be two, this will be the first half of the Bill of Rights. The second and third amendments are short, and they will be sung as a single composition. So there will be four pieces of music. First amendment, second and third, fourth and fifth. So there's a question, who shall I trust, these men 
or this man. This became an important issue to how um, people were going to give the vote to African Americans. And it was because they had suffered greatly in the Civil War that it became impossible to argue against giving them the vote. So there was another campaign at the exact same time. Again, I apologize that the, that the lighting is a little hard to see these pictures. But those, that's um, from around the time after the Civil War, there are all these women who have taken care of soldiers, who, who've changed their wounds, who've um, helped out with um, um, creating uniforms for them. So the question was, can't we trust these women? There was a big effort at that moment for uh, giving franchise to African Americans and also to women. It's a time in the country where one historian said, it's when all the blacks were men and all the women were white. There started to be this strange coalition. It was working together really well, so well, that Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I think she may still be here, she saw an opportunity. We intend to avail ourselves of the strong arm and blue uniform of the black soldier to walk in by his side. What a great picture. Of course. Why don't we just have both people? Let's trust all those people. Let's give everybody the vote. Black soldiers and women. That was the hope. Unfortunately, it turns out the door was fairly narrow. Wendell Phillips, and I have nothing to say against Wendell Phillips. Again, an abolitionist. He was, he did not eat sugar. He did not wear cotton. He understood how horrible slavery was. But he read the politics of the time. One question at a time. The hour belongs to the Negro. And then we have, as somebody pointed out who was over there, yes, it's the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment gives the rights of, oh, well, this kind of sounds familiar. Chorus. Did you notice, like, look at this. You could probably sing these. You could probably do a Neely Bruce. The right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of they wanted to add sex. They wanted to squeeze it in. This was 52 years before the 19th Amendment. It was so close. All it would take is three letters. Three letters. S, E, X. Put them in there somewhere on account of race, sex, color, or previous condition of servitude. And then do you notice that section two, exactly the same language? The muscle, section two. They were ready for that to happen. It did not happen. In fact, sad, 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 the 14th Amendment, the first time, not the 15th, the 14th Amendment, which comes right before that, is the very first time the word male appears in the US Constitution. A big step forward in the 14th Amendment. It's a Reconstruction Amendment. It is restricting what states can do. It gives us that really important phrase, equal protection under the law. It also says male. So we give and we take. It opens and it closes. So there were many arguments against women's suffrage at this time. Women occupy a higher position than men, and I, for one, do not want to drag them down from that exalted sphere. Right? That's a beautiful place to be, women. You get into politics, it gets nasty. And that's also not unlike what Lucretia Mott said. Politics is, I don't want to swear in these chambers, it's dirty. Politics is very dirty. Lucretia Mott said, be careful what you ask for, ladies. So there is an element where these two people have something in common. Women are not independent actors. 
And that's a big one, because they were understood to either be under the sway of their father or their husband. So that was an argument for why women could not get the vote. It would just magnify the votes of married men. So that was not going to be a good idea. Although here's the reverse of that. The young lady would control everything with the young gallants. So yes, you give women the vote, and they'll use their special moves, and they'll say, you vote for that person I like. So there was this idea that giving women the vote, and then not only would they have no power, they'd use their special powers to make sure things went our way. That was a great vote. And then this is the key one. And this is still the law of the land. If you read the Bush v. Gore, 2000 U.S. Supreme Court decision, suffrage is not a natural right. I always feel like, oh, did you know that? Suffrage is not a natural right, but it's simply a means of government. States give the right to vote. States take the right to vote. And um, we have that with felons in many states, not this one. But there's many ways in which a person can lose their right to vote. It is not a natural right. And if you notice that 19th Amendment that has now been put to music so beautifully, it does not say there that it is a natural right. It says no state shall abridge on account of sex. That's different than saying it's a natural right. And so here's where we start to get into some interesting ideas on what did it mean for women to vote. And again, we're going to hear, uh, well, in just a second, um, in 1879, here was a strong argument for why women should get the vote. When our mothers, wives, sisters vote with us, we will have purer legislation and better execution of the laws, fewer tippling shops, gambling halls, and brothels. And this was a statement that made a lot of sense because uh, and Neely kind of gave this away. Before the 19th Amendment, there was the 18th Amendment. Does anybody know what the 18th Amendment did? Prohibition. Prohibition, exactly. So there was just a strong move in this country by women using some of their other rights to pass temperance laws. And this was an argument for why you wanted women to vote. You would have less lascivious behavior. And then we have this other one from our, oops, from our friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Women's suffrage would dilute the ignorant far vote. Right, exactly. She said it in 1866. She said it in 1898. Maybe she was at her wit's end. I mean, that's a long time to be working for trying to get women's vote. And, wh and why, time and again, it could not happen. So um, I don't want to judge Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but we understand of, of how people get the suffrage. It is often at somebody else's expense. And that's what Elizabeth Cady Stanton did. OK, now we can get back to our Bill of Rights questions. So women may have not had the vote, but they must have had other rights. And we did mention in this, my earlier quiz, somebody said the First Amendment. Are there other rights, you think, in the Bill of Rights, just curious, assembly. that women had? Assembly. assembly. Assembly, exactly. Very important. And which amendment is that from? What? I think we need some help. I, this is exactly what we needed. Was like, was it the third? Or was it the fourth? Or was it the first? Let's find it out. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
honor, at least in the first half of the Bill of Rights, we can start to answer some of those questions. Well, what rights did women have? Harry Chapman Catt, who uh, was a suffragist, and just because it's the 100th anniversary, I only recently learned suffragette. It's not the term that we use in the United States. Uh, we use the word suffragist because usually suffragette uh, was used in a derogatory way. So put that on your calendar for 2020. It's suffragist, not suffragette. So here is uh, Carrie Chapman Cat, who is a suffragist. Look at what they did. 480 campaigns to get legislatures to submit suffrage amendments to voters. Which amendment is that? <laughs> Which, somebody said it earlier, what amendment makes that possible? Speech, First Amendment. 17 campaigns to get state constitutional conventions to write women's suffrage into state constitutions. That's the first against, again, with assembly. 277 campaigns to get state party conventions to include women's suffrage planks in party platforms. That's the first again. 19 campaigns with 19 successive Congresses. They petitioned the Congress for their grievances. I tell you, the First Amendment, if you can't vote, it's the amendment you want to run to. It, it'll take you through the whole life cycle of being a citizen. The first one is about religion. You get to have the largest questions about life. Then it goes to speech. You get to say them to one another, even publish them in the press. And then you gather others through assembly to build your political genius. And then you petition the government for grievances. There's a reason you all just like hit that again and again, because you showed us the life cycle of a citizen. Voting, schmoting, that's what I wish to tell you. Yes, they were meaning voting in order to actualize themselves as citizens. But whether they won in 1849, or won in 1860, or won in 1888, who cares? They were becoming stronger and stronger through the First Amendment. I always like to just hold that out. The First Amendment is an awesome amendment. Here we have some other characters. Uh, if you saw the movie Harriet, here's Harriet Tubman. And then there's the Nancy Hart Militia from Georgia, 1865. That was a militia in the Confederacy. What amendment were these ladies holding on to? Two. Second Amendment. I'm going to guess that everybody knows the Second Amendment really well. When I went to graduate school in the 1990s, the Second Amendment, people hardly talked about. That long ago, you might have put a picture up here and said, what amendment counts? And a lot of people would not have been able to say. So hey, I consider it a step forward that the Second Amendment is better understood. OK, this is your trick question for this section of the Bill of Rights quiz. That's Catherine McKinnon at a podium just like this. See, I could lean over, but I can't do my hair the way she could do her hair. And she told us something very important about the private sphere, which is men's realm of private freedom is women's realm of collective subordination. Which amendment that we just heard is she giving us a total reframe on? Anybody know? I'll give you a hint. You see what that welcome mat says? Come back with a warrant. OK, which amendment was that, people? Fourth. Yes, exactly, the Fourth Amendment. Feminists, second wave feminists in particular, said, um, actually, I would like the officer to come through the door because every Thursday night, he comes home and he beats the blank out of me. So I actually 
don't like this notion of the persons who are secured in their home is completely misrepresenting me. At least that was the argument that people like Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin made. Don't ask for too much privacy, ladies. It's not going to work when you really need it. Now, let's totally change. I, the Violence Against Women Act made a big change. But the Fourth Amendment is something that women had to um, think about. Let's see. So, um, I've got a few more questions about the Bill of Rights. But because we only heard the first five, I'm hoping that we can hear six through 10. Because I'll tell you, with that next slate of rights, the fact that women had the vote has totally changed how we understand one of them. And we'll wait to see which one that is.
you're standing here, people have come as you heard from three different states. We would have a fourth state represented. Uh, that is Vermont. No, no. Maine. 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 Vermont is Vermont. <laughs> Where are we? Uh, but anyway, Maine was supposed to be here, but because of the weather that's impending here, they can't come. But thank you all for all of your hard work. These people have learned this piece in a remarkably short time. They are troopers, thank you. And what could be a better, this, we'll hear more about the Tenth Amendment in just a minute, but what could be a better image of the state's rights amendment than four different voices saying, singing four different things in four different feudal passages. Uh, in the score it says, if William Billings had written a quadruple feud, it might sound something like this. <laughs>
So by this time, women had been voting for 40 years. And a case happened in Florida, Gwendolyn Hoyt. She came home. There was her husband lying on the couch. They had a rocky marriage. They divorced and then remarried. He was a philanderer. I read all these things in the paper. And she hit him with a baseball bat quite significantly. In fact, there were a lot of body fluids. Anyway, we don't need to go into any details, but she's hauled into the pokey. At that point, in Florida, there was a law. The Supreme Court upheld, and it, when this case went to the United States Supreme Court, it upheld a Florida law that automatically exempted women from jury duty. Gwendolyn Brooks <coughs> said, wait a minute, I just got convicted of murder in the second degree, and the jurors were all male. Surely that's a violation of my 14th Amendment protection, or my Sixth Amendment protection. So it went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, actually, Florida gets to make those decisions. I think we have a Justice Harlan in the House. Is that true? Oh, very good. I was hoping we could bring him back. What was your decision, Justice Harlan? Despite the enlightened emancipation of women from the restrictions and protections of bygone years, and their entry into many parts of community life formerly considered to be reserved to men. Woman is still regarded as a center of home and family life. Exactly. 19, thank you very much, Justice Harlan. 1961, it was still understood that if a woman was to be called to a jury, it would be too disruptive to her home. So that was how the Sixth Amendment worked for women. But how did the female electorate, because women did get the vote in the 1920s, change the Bill of Rights? Here's a picture from the 1970s that shows uh, one sign, you can't read it because it's off the screen, but it's vote, baby, vote. And the other is voting is people power. The big case that affected the Bill of Rights, particularly the Ninth Amendment, probably one of the more known of the Supreme Court decisions, is Roe v. Wade. Um, do we have Justice Blackman in the House? Oh yes, there's Justice Blackman, thank you. Yes. <laughs> what, did, what did you have to say, Justice Blackman? Autonomous control? Autonomous control over the development and expression of one's intellect, oh, interests. I think you're Justice Douglas. Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to hear from Justice Douglas. It's so important. I'm glad Justice Douglas came tonight as well. Because Justice Douglas is almost as important as Justice Blackman. But who is Justice Blackman? Do we have Justice Blackman? Oh. He must have left. It's fine. Um, luckily, she leaves these things around so we can find them on the wall. The Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. And I really want to highlight that because there's certain tension in second wave feminism about privacy. We heard earlier Catherine McKinnon's concern that privacy made women more vulnerable in the home. But in 1973, so Catherine McKinnon is after Roe v. Wade. In 1973, um, Justice Blackman said the Ninth Amendment, which she guys sang so beautifully. That's, in some ways, that's the one I like to sing to myself before I go to sleep at night. When, when it's just beautiful. And what is the word you want to use? Consoling. The Ninth Amendment is consoling. Well, here we have an understanding of it, of the privacy, is now not just within a person's home. It's within a person's self. It's ambulatory privacy. We want to also perhaps remember that Catherine McKinnon was not so keen on the Roe v. Wade decision because she thought it actually made life easier 
for the philanderers, the pornographers, then the consequences of their philandering were not as real. So there are always these, that's what I like about human beings. They never stay in their fixed orders. They find other reasons to disagree with each other within those orders. So, um, oh, Douglas, Justice Douglas. Here we have Justice Douglas. You've been so patient. Thank you so much. Great. I found my way. Yes, because Justice Douglas wrote a very important dissenting opinion. Thank you, Justice Douglas. Autonomous control over the development and expression of one's intellect, interests, tastes, and personality. So here is this understanding of privacy, which is very individualistic. Oops, sorry. Freedom of choice is the basic decisions of one's life, respecting marriage, divorce, procreation, contraception, mm -hmm. and the education and upbringing of children. So here's an argument for within the home, domestic issues, but it is also the basic decisions of one's life so that it's not just gender. He wants to expand what the Ninth Amendment can mean. And here's my favorite. Freedom to care for one's health and person. Freedom from bodily restraint or compulsion. Freedom to walk. Stroll or loaf. <laughs> we need to remember this. Justice Douglas, he was always one to wax on and takes things to new extremes. But we should all remember that lovely Ninth Amendment that they all sang. It's consoling because we finally get to loaf. <laughs> but there is always a dissent. And this is one to think about in relationship to the 10th Amendment. Um, Justice White, are you here? Oh, good. Here I am. You're, you're so brave to speak in, in uh, progressive Vermont, Justice White. Anyway, I appreciate you coming back to this. I find no constitutional warrant for imposing such an order of priorities on the people and legislatures of the states. This issue should be left with the people and to the political processes the people have devised to govern their affairs. Right. So here we have an argument for states' rights. And there are many political scientists who say that had the abortion law stayed with the states, it would not have become so contentious. I don't know if they're right, but that's an argument. States thought were bit by bit, one at a time, changing their laws. The Supreme Court comes in, knocks down everything, and certain states get very angry. And that's where we have this building of um, a uh, religious right against abortion, where maybe if it gone with the states, it would not have been so contentious. That's a strange thing to say in 2020. However, this is me always looking on the bright side, if Roe gets overturned, it'll go back to the states. And we'll see what happens. So I, I want to leave you some final questions before we get to hear the 19th Amendment again. Did politics ruin women? That was a big question. For a bunch of different reasons. Some of them were reactionary, and some of them were quicker. Politics, did they ruin women? No. No? Okay. Uh, did women improve the electorate? Yes. Yes? Okay. I hear that. Uh, we do want to remember, though, that one of the arguments for women getting the vote was to dilute. So there was an, a class issue, maybe an ethnic issue, that was always being played out here. So women improved the electorate. We heard a resounding yes. And also that there may be a dark side to it. Ah, do women reduce Americans' tendency to violence? Yes. Oh, mixed, I hear you, mixed. Mixed, mixed, yes. We're here, uh, some say yes, some say no. Yes. Wow, okay. And here's my final one from Lucretia Mott. How might we all seek to enlighten 
the public mind. Have them all sing the bill of rights. And have them all sing the bill of rights. I actually think that's not a bad idea. <laughs> because one of the things that Lucretia Mott reminds us is that we do politics not to win or cause harm to our enemy, but to enlighten the public mind. It's an old idea. I think we could still use it. So those are my just questions to leave you all with, but I wanted to end this evening with another performance of the 19th Amendment, because that's really what we came here to hear. We can supply you with that. Thank you.